Thank you. Uh, I, I, I'm about done with my announcement. I was just going to say that uh, Francesco Di Dotto will be the commentator. Thank you. All right. Thanks for coming out this morning. So I should say uh, this is all work in progress, and I'm still figuring out uh, how I want to proceed. Uh, I also am fairly confident this was not the exact title I sent in, but it is more or less accurate uh, in the abstract as, as I remembered writing it, so I'm presenting the paper I always intended. Uh, the gist of this work in progress, though, starts and ends with uh, this phrase, closing the loop. Uh, so we already heard a bit about this phrase yesterday. Uh, I'll be putting my own spin on it. In fact, this talk will be more or less divided into two parts. Uh, one part reflecting on the subject matter of quantum cosmology, and one part on this phrase, and how I'm trying to relate it to work in quantum gravity phenomenology. So the connection between these two parts is my main offering to you today. And uh, hold on, maybe a bit of a wild bumpy ride. So just to put it up front, uh, I submit that we should think of iterative, target-specific applications of space-time emergence accounts in quantum gravity as an empirically responsible way to leverage the familiar world as quantum gravity phenomena. And the mindset here is thinking in an empirically informed quantum gravity research practice. And then, it's a simple enough connection, work in quantum cosmology, I happen to think, demonstrates well what that sort of general suggestion amounts to. So that's the upshot uh, for my talk. I'm not trying to sneak anything by you. This is the project. Uh, thinking about how we study the quantum gravitational cosmos will, I claim, or I hope to claim, it'll win us a nice perspective on how to engage in empirically responsible quantum gravity research. Or at minimum, just how to feel better as empirically minded folks about the kind of uh, research that already exists in the field. So first part of the talk, reflections on the subject matter of quantum cosmology. And a good place to start us off is this nice big question. Uh, what is the topic of study we have in mind when we entertain quantum cosmology? So I've written what is quantum cosmology on this slide, but an equally appropriate question uh, for my purposes is why quantum cosmology? Uh, what the quotes here indicate is that I'm asking, why is this a string of words that seems meaningful to us now? And moreover, it seems meaningful to us as something that's important to entertain. Uh, so a counterexample, right? A, a purple cow is a string of words uh, that's meaningful, but it just doesn't feel like it's important to entertain. Uh, mad cow, uh, on the other hand, is meaningful and seems like it's important to entertain for a whole host of further reasons. So what are the reasons to entertain something called quantum cosmology? Uh, answering that question requires confronting the first question, what is quantum cosmology? So we can go back to the original slide. Uh, but hopefully that little why digression makes sense. The issue at hand is what is so inherently meaningful about the subject? All right, so one very old line of thinking goes like this. Uh, first, cosmology is the study of the universe as a whole. It perceives itself as something wonderful, undivided, simple, everything together, all that is the case, including us. Uh, I want to preface what I'm about to say by emphasizing this isn't an outdated view. Something like it lies in the background of uh, anthropologists uh, continued research use of the term cosmology today, particularly uh, in conversations with uh, marginalized indigenous communities that perhaps have their own reimaginings of their place at the center of a cosmos, at the center of a world. So the anthropological thought here is that our grand abstracted narratives uh, of our cosmic circumstance, those are culturally significant. They're culturally significant exactly in as much as they're taken to be inherently meaningful to us, the storytellers. On the flip side, one might try to explain our developing these narratives in terms of the inherent meaningfulness of the activity of doing so. Poets, uh, each of us, as we learn how to look up to 
drink in the signals of stars and blossom at their message. We can try to tell a story like this for physical cosmology. Something like the application of concepts and tools developed and empirically supported within the domain of physics taken over to this ambitious, inherently meaningful, abstracted poetic study of our place in the center of a world. And that's perhaps the default popular science model on what uh, physical cosmology is all about. Uh, I think one can trace that pop science treatment of the subject, the meaningfulness of the subject, all the way back to the beginning of the modern field, beginning of the 1930s. It's worth taking seriously, not the least because it might very well explain a lot of physicists' original entry points into the subject matter before they a culture, before they enter into the relevant community and get to work. So as a historical point, uh, since around that same historical moment, it's proven immensely fruitful to approach physical cosmology classically, or really semi-classically. So classical space-time, uh, quantum matter, but quantum matter typically approximately described uh, by classical fluid. But on this story, since cosmology is uh, about everything, and everything is deep down quantum gravitational, physical cosmology ultimately needs to be done in a quantum gravity framework. The kinematic structure of the universe, uh, space and time included, should be shaped with the toolkit of quantum theory. And as good empiricists, we're of course interested in pursuing that kind of project. And through doing so, through pursuing that kind of project, we subsequently track how preliminary conclusions we draw up uh, we draw a hookup to date uh, um, surprising or foregone ends. So we end up at quantum cosmology. So that's one story, if you will, empirical poetry. It's a kind of story that does check out in many respects. It gets us well to conceptual innovations like the Wheeler-DeWitt equation, uh, so constrained wave functional of a frozen universe. Uh, from there to something like a uh, Hartle Hawking proposal or uh, maybe Blenkin's tunneling from nowhere uh, proposal. These are acting some, as something like a quantum cosmology uh, past hypothesis, at least in the simplified case of cosmological sector. So not just pop science now. Uh, there's some matching up with a traditional kind of metaphysical worldview as well. Uh, the simplification to the cosmological sector uh, is justified, meanwhile, based on the security of our knowledge in physical cosmology to date that at least when using semi-classical tools, the totality of everything can evidently be justly represented as an approximately uniform expanding Big Bang space-time with some familiar and some a lot less familiar matter contributions. We use that justification as an excuse to substitute out the wave functional of the frozen universe for a function of finite degrees of freedom that classically correspond to that really, really simple expansion history. And it's that interpreted simple construction that we proceed to study as a physically or empirically responsible means to contemplate the abstracted universe as a whole. That's one picture. Saying nothing of the prospects of studying uh, the Wheeler-DeWitt equation or related subjects, I don't mean to say that thinking about those topics is a mistake. I take it that this old line of reasoning on the whole that I was just sketching, uh, it's largely specious. First, there are long-standing conceptual issues uh, or objections with totalities standing in representation as relations to anything in particular. Uh, fairly recently in that sort of long history on that topic, we have a philosopher Nagel in the mid-20th century arguing about difficulties with developing a view from nowhere. So quantum cosmology might very well just not be a responsible way of poetically contemplating totality. In any case, I think complaining on general grounds like that is not a very encouraging route of critique. Uh, that's not how I'm going to critique the empirical poetry reading on cosmology. One reason it's not is that uh, this kind of critique sets up recent projects in perspectivism or perspectival realism as natural ideological antagonists to quantum cosmology. And I don't particularly like that. Uh, I'd like to be able to defend both. I'm not going to get sidetracked. Um, explaining perspectivism here, but just to raise the basic issue, uh, the general, the, the basic issue here is that a general route of critique focusing on the nature of totality 
distracts us with a very different question. Uh, something like, why might we ever have thought totality gets to be uh, adequately treated in terms of physics? Uh, so most folks are generally fond of pluralism in scientific inquiry. Uh, and the usual answer is that physicalists might give, in the context of physical cosmology, hardly help to answer uh, the question because it raises, it distracts with a further question. Um, why does physical totality get to be treated with the toolkits developed in fundamental physics, specifically quantum gravity? Uh, why is the granted physical universe such a physical thing that's essentially quantum gravitational and not a physical thing like, say, a wooden plank? Maybe quantum gravity deep down, but nobody really cares. To be clear, I think we can come up with interesting answers to these sorts of questions, but I think doing so is hard if we're holding on to the totality framing in the background. I'd rather just be talking physics and ordinary physical arguments about the differences between interesting target systems, such as, say, wooden planks versus black holes or um, mergers or a Big Bang cosmos. So a non-answer to the question, what is cosmology, is everything. Uh, I just discussed, it isn't the empirical poetic study of totality approach on gravity-wise in the context of physical cosmology, and given the successes of physical cosmology approach thus far of semi-classical means. I've signaled, signaled that I prefer ordinary physics reasoning about what uh, tools and methods seem germane for what kinds of physical systems. Uh, so Francesca uh, indirectly makes, I think, a really nice argument along these lines. Uh, in her own discussion of quantum cosmology, uh, which she explicitly contrasts with totology. So in some sense, amplifying part of what I, I take from an old project of hers. As she casts it, or at least as what I extract from her discussion, is that quantum cosmology is basically, simply, just the application of methods that are being developed in quantum gravity research that get applied to a particular kind of physical system that we just so happen to have interest in studying quantum gravity research. All right. I think very easy to understate what's happening in this move uh, when already we're knee deep or totally immersed in quantum gravity research. And so what I'm going to be trying to do here is overstating the point to compensate. Francesca's message here is a fantastic inversion of everything I was just saying by way of the cultural, anthropological, or pop science, or traditional metaphysics non-answer. Instead of understanding quantum cosmology as empirical poetry inherently meaningful to its writers, we're just gonna start with the idiosyncratic interests of a particular scientific research community. Those who have found or created meaning in a number of related everyday acts that are aimed at some further end. Uh, something like solving the problem of quantum gravity. So that sort of person contextualized quantum cosmology as just something cleverly to do with parochial interests of the community that's built up around persons like that. Uh, it's something cleverly to do with those parochial interests, which can moreover foster that community's ongoing willful work toward those further ends. So to be more explicit, researchers begin with semi-classical tools and they're making meaningful to their further research intents, a certain kind of physical system. Uh, this is the physical system which we can think of familiarly as the semi-classical expanding cosmos. And the crucial phenomenon of interest to study by any means about that system is what we might label cosmic expansion history, uh, or else maybe evolution of large scale structure, growth of large scale structure, whatever, the stuff we were talking about yesterday. You see what's happening here. We're constructing a system to study in quantum gravity research using quantum gravity methods by means of interpretations ported over from the semi-classical context. Where we end up is that with those interpretational tools, we can associate the new quantum gravity system as telling us something about large scale degrees of freedom evolving in relation to small scale observers, according to a wonderfully simple dynamics. In other words, layering, uh, layering the world by frequency scales, quantum cosmology winds up the study of the big physical stuff relative to us 
often a physical environment uh, composed of the small scale or high frequency modes. We are the high energy participants in quantum cosmos studying our low energy counterparts. So I'm not opposed to talking poetically, even if the point of the, the meaningfulness of the subject is not its poetry. So Francesca does not draw out uh, that last point about the observer essentially living above a high energy cutoff in a momentum space description of quantum cosmos. But another way of putting this point is that the observer in quantum cosmology is uh, schematized as small and yet totally smeared across space, utterly non-localized. The significance of the cosmological principle, the familiar cosmological principle in semi-classical uh, cosmology, so spatial isotropy, homogeneity, no twist, that gets reinterpreted in this picture as an assumption that we can relate that weird, smeared, non-localized observer uh, to the more familiar, high-frequency, spatially localized us in a principled manner. And the upshot is that quantum cosmology gets to be the study of a particular simple, well-behaved phenomenon, cosmic expansion history, relative to a schematic of the observer that is not so unreasonable, at least if we're happy to embrace something like the cosmological principle, as an outgrowth of something like um, the Copernican principle about how we draw statistical inferences from limited cosmological data. Right, so here's the idea. We have a system of low frequency modes observed everywhere by high frequency modes that carry clocks. Why quantum cosmos? Quantum cosmology on this story. The answer, as far as I can tell, is something pretty plainly stated. Well, in quantum gravity research, unlike in semi-classical gravity, there's no physical reason to treat our small scale, large scale split of the cosmos as anything other than conventional within the physical system under study which is, again, this new thing, this quantum cosmos. So to summarize, what is quantum cosmology? Well, it's the semi-classical phenomenon of cosmic expansion history, or large-scale structure growth, only repackaged or rendered in a manner consistent with the quantum gravity of a small observer. I think this way of talking is immensely satisfying. It suitably diminishes the problem, or it diminishes quantum cosmology to one small interesting part of the problem of quantum gravity. A problem pursued by a particular community for further reasons in high energy physics. And it diminishes quantum cosmology to a small part of that larger problem by emphasizing a phenomenon that quantum gravity, given a particular schematic of the observer as high energy and maximally smeared across semi-classical space, that sort of uh, theory of quantum gravity ought to be responsive to. That's a, a crucial point, in my view. The ought here, that quantum gravity ought to be responsive to this phenomenon. It doesn't exactly have to do with stuff out there in the world, per se. The world just is. Quantum gravity ought to be responsive to the world dressed up according to the semi-classical interpretation in virtue of quantum gravity researchers' further theoretical interests. Those are what entail a certain conventionality to the high frequency, low frequency splitting up of the cosmos now run, rendered a, a quantum gravity target. So the meaning that they end up imbuing into their overall intention, creative work to produce something else, a future theory of quantum gravity, that's what winds up driving a fact of the matter that quantum gravity ought to be able to cover an empirically supported quantum cosmology. So let me take you through uh, two takeaways from this inversion thesis, this inversion of the empirical poetic project of quantum cosmology to quantum cosmology done in the service of further parochial quantum gravity researcher driven ends. First, quantum gravity phenomena are as large as we may conceive. How's this a conclusion? Well, given the inversion thesis, even the expansion history of the semi-classical cosmos relative to a high frequency observer smeared everywhere through space, that can be rendered a quantum gravity phenomenon. And by construction, we can't conceive a phenomenon larger than that. But more than that, return to the language from the slide. We're taking a semi-classical phenomenon and rendering it or repackaging it as quantum gravity. I'm not being glib when I say that this cosmic expansion history thing is as large as we may conceive. The familiar terms from the monster apparatus of semi-classical gravity are what underwrite cosmic expansion history being big. 
Does anyone doubt that the semi-classical cosmos is supposed to let nothing else be larger? I don't think that's uh, a deep point in itself. But it does immediately focus our attention to the lingering place for semi-classical interpretations as we get down into the quantum gravity research. If you'd like, the quantum cosmos is semi-classically speaking as big as could be conceived. We aren't throwing away the interpretational resources from the semi-classical as soon as we have a description available in the quantum gravity. So this is the bigger point then, at least some quantum gravity phenomena, and I count cosmic expansion history as one example, are just semi-classical phenomena repurposed. To say it more carefully, application-specific uses of the tools being developed in quantum gravity to discuss semi-classical space-time emergence, they wind up uh, in successful instances, giving us empirical phenomena that the quantum gravity theory is to be beholden to. We understand those empirical phenomena in semi-classical terms, but we expect a theory of quantum gravity to do the heavy lifting. Uh, in other words, spelling out application-specific uses of space-time emergence stories to recover familiar physics, that counts as ongoing quantum gravity research done in a such a way as can be tightly empirically constrained by the world. Now the second conclusion. Uh, I should mention my abstract uh, had a third intermediary conclusion about uh, UVIR mixing disappearing in the recovery of these familiar semi-classical uh, targets. I've cut that for time and also because my thoughts are at this point much more tentative on that subject. So the second conclusion that I've included here is that quantum gravity phenomena are more than just emergent dynamics and initial conditions. And all I mean by this is that the application-specific emergence accounts that I just majorly elevated in the empirical foundations of quantum gravity, uh, those accounts require attending to a whole motley of ingredients off in the boundary against which uh, we can associate some familiar empirically motivated dynamics with a space-time interpretation in semi-classical gravity regimes. This is a conclusion from the inversion thesis discussed above in the sense that we already saw one prime example of relevant ingredients off in the boundary, uh, the emergence of semi-classical interpreted cosmic expansion history that has to come by way of a schematic of the observer that carried over intertheoretically in the right sort of way winds up shaking hands nicely with more classical conceptions of a high energy spatialized, spatially localized observer of cosmic expansion history. All right, so I said at the beginning that the other part of the talk will be about this phrase uh, and how I'm relating it to quantum gravity phenomenology. First, uh, this isn't a pun on loop quantum gravity. Uh, it could be if somebody else would like to make it one. Uh, rather, I have in mind here George Smith's account of Newton's methodology, which he frames in terms of this rhetorical device, closing the loop. And here I should uh, warn, as I, I teased yesterday, I'll be giving my own idiosyncratic take on closing the loop. Truth be told, I don't really know the origin of this idiosyncratic take. So George's paper uh, came out when I was an undergraduate, like first getting into philosophy of cosmology during a thesis project with him. And so I remember talking with him about a draft of the paper. It's possible that the idiosyncrasies snuck in all the way back then, and I'm just going to be elevating, like, a pitiful undergrad way of approaching the subject. I don't think this is true. Uh, I think my own spin came later, but it's possible. So the idea of his closing the loop, the constitutive assumption really, is that what Newton did through his reasoning practices that led him to an inference about universal gravity was that he deployed a method. The application of this method amounted to him securing a universal 1 over r squared attractive force relation among bodies as something like a learned truth or empirically informed physical claim about our Earth and cosmos. As Smith sets it up, physicists and philosophers were confused for a very long time about what that learning amounts to. They were confused about what it means to recognize that Newton, through application of his method, had secured the force relation as a learned truth. And they were confused enough that with the advent of relativity, it felt natural to conclude that Newton really hadn't secured any such thing even though many of the hypotheses generated out of the theory had been confirmed in the intervening centuries. Uh, but concluding from the advent of relativity that Newton hadn't secured the 1 over r squared 
uh, law was a mistake. The most stringent tests of the learned truth of Newtonian gravity are, after all, today's tests of general relativity. The theory that we understand to now underwrite the correctness of the Newtonian theory in its appropriate regimes. So the philosophical project at hand then for Smith, for George, is to reflect on what is the method which we are assuming constitute Newton's reasoning practices. What is the thing responsible for Newton securing a piece of stable theoretical knowledge about the world around us, knowledge that persists even through radical theory change to today? And the hope more broadly is to learn something about what we ultimately mean when we say things like, we've learned something through the doing of physics research. That is, can we take the standard that we develop uh, for what it means for Newton to have caused us to learn something through the course of his physics research, can we take that standard and use it to do epistemology of physics elsewhere? Can we apply our reasoning about method to help critique or improve the epistemic status of what's being done in other areas of physics and ideally in contemporary physics? Can thinking of learning about physics in terms of researchers closing the loop uh, in the course of their research, as Smith held, holds of Newton, can that help us analyze some of what's going on in contemporary streams of research? What, if anything, are we learning through physics research done today? So we heard a bit about Chris and Adam using the closing the loop account uh, in early universe cosmology. Um, we also heard it in sort of a, a negative deployment. I want to think about it in the context of quantum gravity, and I want to try to use the closing the loop account to get a, a positive message going as well. Nice symmetry. Because in some sense, the basic problem I'm wrestling with uh, is frankly some dissatisfaction with the implicit logic at work in much of what gets done in research under the banner of quantum gravity phenomenology. So by making that confession, I mean to provoke, but I don't mean to offend, principally because I'd much rather be correct, I might not be, but I'd much rather be correct in claiming the quantum gravity phenomenology community as my kinfolk, should they be so welcoming. I think of myself here in this project at least as an empiricist or an empirical philosopher, someone keen to understand how contemporary scientific research through its being empirically informed, sort of mysterious phrase, how that amounts to us securing for ourselves learned knowledge about the cosmos and our place as participants within it. So too, I presume, those engaged in quantum gravity phenomenology are interested in how the empirical world figures into the lessons that we can truly be said to learn through the successful doing of everyday quantum gravity research. At the very least, they're the members within the larger quantum gravity research community who are interested in letting the world have a voice in the theoretical task at hand, providing an opportunity, say, for the world to push back in the community's ongoing production of sophisticated future theory. In any case, I'm dissatisfied. As I say, I'd rather it be that I'm kin with quantum gravity phenomenologists than see myself in opposition to them. In particular, it's with that mindset, not the mindset of an antagonist, that I meet with despair a certain common lore one sometimes hears about quantum gravity research. We heard it yesterday, in fact, in passing. So according to that lore, quantum gravity research proceeds largely unconstrained by physical data. I sort of, I, I lament. What charitably could that lore mean? Surely, regardless, it can't be true, at least not entirely so. There's a community, my community, I want to claim, whose very existence seems predicated on the lore being false. So that's where my dissatisfaction began, me trying to get an almost ordinary language philosophy on the common lore. Uh, I gave a talk a couple months ago about how we might interpret that common lore and what ways it's both true and false, appropriately interpreted. In fact, I, I believe I've made peace with the common lore, and some of that peace has necessarily made it into this talk, this project. Uh, and maybe you already glimpsed it in the first half of the talk. I did claim that space-time emergence accounts were a route toward a tightly empirically constrained quantum gravity research. Tight here explicitly in contrast with the largely unconstrained language that I used a moment ago in this, to summarize the common lore. But set aside discussion explicitly on the lore, principally what I'm after today is to correct one description of the reasoning practices that occur in quantum gravity phenomenology. I called it a moment ago the implicit logic in quantum gravity phenomenology. I don't claim that any one party has put forth this uncorrected description. Uh, in fact, I think most who would offer this description are just largely unaware that there is something called quantum gravity phenomenology to talk about. But I do s suspect that the uncorrected description of what's going on uh, rattles in the background of everyday reflections 
in the wider scientifically informed community regarding the status and prospects of theoretical speculations in quantum gravity research. Uh, so that it gives the common lore much of its substance and bite. So I'm just going to quickly run through the description and criticize it along the way. OK, so first, it's crucial to note in these sorts of discussions, quantum gravity research exists plurally. When one speaks of quantum gravity research being done, most often one has in mind work done within one or another approach to quantum gravity, string theory, holography, loop quantum gravity, and so on. I think it's an interesting open question, the extent to which these approaches amount to separate research programs in the sense of Lakatish. Uh, it's differing in their hard cores, even though they're nominally all committed to the same goal. Uh, whatever we want to say about that subject, though, uh, I think it can be agreed that what it means to work on one approach is to provisionally take on board the terms that are spelled out by that approach as could be relevant to the project of developing new quantum gravity theory at, for the empirical world. So working on an approach amounts to adopting that approach and one's thinking about how quantum gravity might itself uh, make itself known in the world. It becomes possible within an approach to isolate physically loaded features of the theories of quantum gravity that might eventually come out of the approach and to regard those features as possibly empirically relevant. So given all that, quantum gravity phenomenology says work on those possibly empirically relevant, physically loaded features that are possibly to come in theories arising suitably far into the late stages of the various approaches. Figuring out how to get a physical world out of a given preliminary proposal and formalism to get a glimpse of what to do as researchers developing the theory to form a judgment about whether taking those steps is fruitful to worldly ends, that's not an easy task. Uh, I think the difficulty involved serves as partial explanation for the uh, social fact that contemporary quantum gravity research is plural, that is approach specific resources are evidently invaluable to the task at hand. Uh, but more importantly here, the difficulty accounts for the existence of quantum gravity phenomenology construed as an active specialist field of research in quantum gravity conceived across approaches. Difficulties involved in getting a physical world out of preliminary formalism legitimate particular kinds of expertise. So quantum gravity phenomenologists are in the present line experts in pursuing hints about tomorrow's empirically relevant quantum gravitational physics. So in some sense, the description I'm giving here uh, paints a picture that what quantum gravity phenomenologists get up to, how they use their expertise, is to generate hints about future physics, to sort of triangulate maybe within approach, maybe across approaches, these hints. Um, you might worry that triangulating future truths through like current approaches uh, might not be the right sort of triangulation argument. A uh, phrase like barking up the wrong tree is a common phrase that's meant to counsel against this attitude. Um, I don't actually want to take that line. I, I think it's plausible, but maybe there's a response to be developed. Uh, so that's not the problem that I'm going to be identifying. It's not my biggest source of dissatisfaction. Uh, bigger criticism comes in the next step. Uh, through this sort of triangulation activity, uh, hint studying within or across approaches, quantum gravity phenomenologists are generating for themselves uh, and the wider quantum gravity research community some generic sense for quantum gravitational physics. Uh, the essential claim here, in other words, is that we have a procedure for generating quantum gravity intuitions in the course of ongoing plural research towards future theory, and that's what the phenomenologists get up to, uncovering some sort of intuitive content. Uh, that's not actually the issue I'm taking. I'm happy for uh, intuitive quantum gravity to be a thing. Um, I can explain why if there's interest later. My dissatisfaction is that on the basis of those new intuitions about the quantum gravity of the empirical world, one evidently proceeds to form some hypotheses in the philosophical sense. Um, appeal to these hypotheses secured by a matter of researcher intuition, uh, and you see how the world uh, gets back to you. The big problem I have with this step, this way of conceiving, is that uh, it feels an unproductive mindset about how remote are the really interesting regimes of quantum gravity. Naysayers can very easily retort that maybe the familiar world just isn't all that teeming with effects of quantum gravity, uh, because, say, effective field theories are as successful for us as they evidently have been, for instance. So suddenly, the familiarity of the effective world can be weaponized against the prospects of interesting empirical work in quantum gravity. And that's not purely imagination on my part. I think that's a lot of the history of conversation in this space. And very recently, 
I understand this to be the foothold that E.S. and Steinhardt have taken in recent years against thinking of even the Big Bang as cause for quantum gravity speculations. Uh, I think there's a really interesting conversation to be had there that I'll bracket off for discussion. And the bigger problem, and these are related uh, with this hypothetical deductive mindset, is um, something to do with the problem of unconceived alternatives. Uh, hypothetical deductive method just isn't a satisfying framework for underwriting confidence in knowledge claims about the universe unless we're in uh, unless we're thinking in terms of some sort of a limited reasoning in a small learning environment, a small world that's exhausted by known articulable hypotheses, whose consequences we know how to compute. This small world assumption was what drove the philosophical mistake of simultaneously regarding Newton's method as hypothetical deductive and taking the ontology of the confirmed theory to be the learned truth, only to throw up hands in dismay in the wake of relativity. Uh, essentially what's going on there is we good reason to think we live in a large shrouded world, not a small world. And so framing in terms of finding hypotheses to test is unproductive. So I'm pretty much uh, out of time. The general uh, project here is to turn to George Smith's closing the loop, ultimately to hope for something better than hypothetical deductive logic behind quantum gravity phenomenology. Um, and the big idea here is that the spark in Newton's inferential engine, as Smith casts it, is his use of the 1 over r squared force relation to compute basic gravitational dynamics of systems. That might look like putting forth a hypothesis to study consequences, especially because the next step is to interpret empirical data in light of those dynamics. But here's where we get more subtle. We interpret empirical data in light of those dynamics. We note marginal discrepancies in that data. And then we push through the same interpretation of a 1 over r squared relation onto those discrepancies as inferences to robust physical sources, which would be responsible for those discrepancies. Uh, and the upshot is that instead of letting the world test the theory, we embrace the theory from the get-go and ask whether the world so interpreted indeed turns out to have more in it than we at first thought, given the total data we've collected. Can the resources of the theory make sense of the discrepant data under assumption that there's more in the world than the familiar, more in the world than what we thought was there when we first started? So this is what strikes me as most striking, and I flag idiosyncratic to my view on, of Smith's proposal. The method can be construed as involving the creation of new phenomena out of the discrepant data assuming the theory were true. So we create new real phenomena for the theory now to save in whatever manner we expect theory to be able to save the phenomena. Uh, but crucially, the creation of the new phenomena goes by way of the physicists choosing to push through the interpretation of their very same theory, which on first pass just failed to be fit for modeling purposes. What you wind up with when you push this iterative mentality through is that evidence for the theory's success ends up being tantamount to learning something new about what is in the world or what the world is ultimately like and vice versa. Right. What does that look like in context of thinking about quantum gravity? Um, thinking in terms of holding on to whole interpretive packages to iteratively create phenomena, thereby learning something new about the previously familiar world through the doing of physics research. Uh, that stands as a sharp competitor to the common setup I was walking us through a moment ago within quantum gravity phenomenology. We're not isolating quantum gravity intuitions within our cross approaches and just modeling consequences of the intuitive quantum gravity taking place in the familiar world. This approach, this method is active instead of passive. That's the point. The world, say, isn't teeming with quantum gravity or worryingly possibly not teeming with enough quantum gravity at all ready to test our theories. To the contrary, the world is just providing the materials we use to create quantum gravity phenomena that get spelled out according to those theories. Uh, and that provides a check on the very same theories in the course of their development. So here's where I'm leaving you, uh, a connection between the two parts of this talk. Take as the example, the worked example, the semi-classical cosmos now rendered a quantum gravity phenomenon. Get the hang of it. Uh, in the context of ongoing quantum gravity research, how the theory still in development can account for emergence of cosmic expansion history. But then, of course, we already have a rich record of discrepancies. Our entire theory of structure growth, for instance, is necessarily anisotropic. 
Uh, likewise, over on the quantum gravity side, there are all sorts of places to go looking for iteratively robust sources in the quantum gravitational world of those discrepancies, getting off the ground by closing the loop strategy. Discrepancies due to significant corrections in the dynamics that stick around at the limit is one example. Uh, an actual dynamical evolution or initial conditions that are spelled out in the recovered low energy regime. Another, uh, in features of the boundary, uh, like global structure or the schematic of the observer and more, each of these are places to look to get out the familiar discrepancies we already have. And this isn't to put cosmology above physics, so remember that inversion thesis that I made a big deal of. I think some really interesting work on quantum black holes can fit a similar iterative closing the loop method. In a nutshell, starting from simple models motivated by the goals of quantum gravity research, like those possibly suited to recover familiar zeroth order cosmic expansion history, then treating existing familiar semi-classical physics like anisotropies and structure growth as the discrepancies to be given a robust quantum gravitational account, that's how we might get a start on closing the loop in quantum gravity phenomenology taking place within a familiar, more or less semi-classical world. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mike. Francesca. Yeah, thank you, Mike. Uh, it was a pleasure to, to start the day with your talk, uh, and it was a pleasure to glimpse to the uh, draft of this presentation. I should say that you have a way to look uh, at quantum gravity. Uh, sometimes we have a kind of vertigo looking at quantum gravity, and you take it with a kind of meditative approach that is refreshing to me. <laughs> So, but so here I want to play the pragmatic side and the more uh, the, the, the the perspective of someone who has uh, the uh, the mandala path, so the hands on, on the on the theory, and in particular trying to do um, phenomenology with quantum gravity. I really like it, the part of your talk in which you were saying uh, um, that our task is the creation of new phenomena by uh, somehow pushing the interpretation of the theory. And uh, this is a very powerful way to look at the work that we need to do. And it's really an encouragement uh, of uh, not just uh, doing the shut up and calculate, but go through the interpretation, because it's only through the interpretation that we can understand what are the relevant phenomena that can lead then to the phenomenology. So this is somehow a way of stating in a nice uh, philosophical manner a mantra that uh, uh, some people, uh, like Carlo Rovelli in particular, has been repeating uh, to our own communities on loop quantum gravity, but I think this is a general lesson. So to take seriously what the, the theory is uh, uh, saying that is another way of uh, expressing the fact that we need an interpretation. We need to make a clean up of what are the the fundamental element uh, in the theory, and then use this uh, to extract the phenomenology. And uh, this connects uh, with uh, something you were saying uh, during the talk that uh, on which maybe I would like uh, to to push you a bit because uh, uh, I think there are some. Uh, uh, some elements that you were taking as equivalent. Huh? And I would like to, to try to, to ask you what you think, because I think there, is a, uh, there, is, there are concepts that need not to be equate. So in particular, uh, the fact that uh, when we talk uh, uh, about uh, uh, phenomenology, we don't need to go to the semi-classical theory. So you were talking about uh, emergence, and uh, on this I'm totally with you. I think there is an equivalence in quantum gravity between uh, the notion of emergence. and So the only sense in which there is a theory that is emerging is in the sense of a classical limit. Um, even though one should be careful because there are aspects uh, of the classical space-time that are already present in the full quantum theory. And on the other hand, there are aspects 
in the full quantum theory uh, that are not there in the classical theory and we should exploit. Uh, we, so we really, I, I really see your uh, point in trying to look what are these ingredients and how we can connect this with phenomena. For instance, uh, uh, from my background, one of these uh, would be the discreteness. And, but sometimes we, we make the effort to, to try to define exactly what is uh, the relation between the quantum discreteness uh, and the classical continuous theory. And uh, my sense of this is that uh, uh, there is really a lot of effort in trying to make uh, this connection um, mathematically precise, uh, while maybe we should just trust what the theory is telling us uh, and just plug it into some effective theory and see what phenomena uh, this uh, leads us to, to explore. So just to make an example of this, so you were rightly citing uh, this new ideas about uh, non-singular black holes. Like in the case of a black to white transition, this is a kind of phenomenon that cannot be captured by semi-classical approximations. So it's a tunneling process that is uh, a, a prototypical uh, quantum process, a non-perturbative one. So as long as you try to, to express this, you try to understand this with uh, semi-classical tools, basically, you don't see even the phenomena happening. So it's exactly this process of going uh, into the depth of the quantum theory that allows you then to, to imagine the presence, to, to, to realize that there are new phenomena uh, present there. Um, I just maybe want to say a, a word regarding, uh, one more word regarding uh, phenomenology because uh, uh, one thing that you said very clearly is that there is this law about uh, uh, we don't have uh, uh, quantum gravity, uh, quantum gravity uh, data, and I really think that that is a, a wrong way. I think you you share this feeling that this is a wrong way. This is a month, uh, uh, something that we we hear repeatedly, but it's not. True, <laughs> in the sense that uh, we do have data. We have a lot of data that are constraining our theories. Huh? So, uh, for instance, uh, of course, we, we have a theory of cosmological perturbations. And even if yesterday I was saying that there are a lot of parameters uh, entering in understanding the theory um, from the cosmological side, but nevertheless, this brings us constraints on the kind of theory of quantum gravity we can work with. For instance, if in the early universe uh, your theory is uh, uh, breaking Lorentz invariance, we already know that this theory is ruled out. So just to say like Orava gravity <laughs> should not be viable. Or for instance, we have other things that uh, have been, uh, so nature have been speaking to us uh, uh, with the fact that uh, uh, we haven't witnessed uh, supersymmetry, uh, supersymmetry particles at uh, LHC. We haven't seen any violation of Lorentz uh, uh, of the Lorentz symmetry, at least. Uh, so this Lorentz symmetry cannot violate it in any naive way. We also have seen uh, that uh, the speed of gravity, the speed of gravitons, uh, is basically very very close to the, the speed of light, if not equal. So this has already killed a lot of uh, uh, possible theories. So again, we are not just uh, going uh, in, uh, in a space blindly in which we don't have any phenomenology. We do have phenomenology and we have to take it seriously and to, to look for new phenomena. Indeed, we, we need to do, I think, what you are suggesting. So looking at the interpretation of the theory. So it's not just enough. Um, to shut up and calculate, so you need, we really need to to look into this. I, I should so again. I should say that in in the community, very often people have been blocked in doing phenomenology because they wanted a, a, a very clean uh, pictures at the mathematical level, uh, thinking that we are not allowed to do phenomenology unless. Uh, all the details uh, of uh, the mathematical structure of the theory are defined. But th this 
uh, to me has blocked a lot of <laughs> energy, a lot of possible uh, beautiful results. Because of course, for instance, uh, with the, the Feynman Pati integral, uh, there are a lot. Even back then, there were a lot of. Uh, there were not a full mathematical uh, um, clean uh, uh, structure, but nevertheless, uh, we were seeing that it was working to give uh, predictions. And uh, I think with quantum gravity, we are in a similar situation. And the only way in which we can make the jump is exactly looking at uh, what stays in the theory, what is solid in the theory, and what is accessory. And then, of course, there is the problem that when you try to go from the fundamental level to, to the phenomenology, there are so many steps so that your predictions are not definitive in terms of proving the theory or falsifying the theory. And this is, of course, a big problem. But unless we can we keep on trying this uh, and we, uh, we have a richness uh, in possible phenomenological effects, then we have no way, again, to make the theory uh, going ahead. And, uh, and, and so there is this back and forth be, be, between uh, theory and observations uh, uh, in a healthy way and in, a rich, in the richer possible way, not, not trying to block <laughs> the two sides, but actually trying to, to have the work going towards more and more suggestions, let's see. Yeah. Yes. Please, Mike. Yeah. Uh, some brief responses to, to part of that. So I guess uh, first I'll say on the on the pushing back part that I was focused too much in the, at the very least, the rhetorical structure of the argument on, call it phenomena where semi-classical resources suffice to describe the observations, something like that. Um, point taken. Uh, I guess my thought is that the easiest place to motivate the sense in which we can get an iterative strategy going is in those contexts where we already have a sense of what the iterations look like coming out of the semi-classical. And the goal now is to find quantum gravity giving rise to each levels of each loop in that iteration. But you're absolutely right that there I think by the scope of the argument, there ought to be, hopefully, similar iterative looping that we can get into, even where our semi-classical tools impoverish us to talk about the phenomenon. So yeah, I think that's right to push on that. The other thing I'll say is on the, the lore or the mantra frustration. So this is the, the other talk I alluded to a couple months ago, the, the cheapest way of making the point is when people say there, there's not quantum gravity data or it's largely unconstrained is large is a totally vague and unspecified way of putting things. Uh, it sounds, it, it masquerades like it's talking about the, say, epistemic or logical structure of the theory or the current status of the theorizing, but actually it's, I, I think, it's cryptically a comment on like, what kind of activities are sanctioned by peers in the community as counting for at least publishable unit. And by the time you get over there, that's like weakened the claim substantially because there might be lots of constraint. So like overall, like emerging out of the activity, there might be lots of considerations. There's certainly a lot of papers that are not sanctioned by peers as counting as quantum gravity because they fail to meet the basic checks. Um, like recovering um, Lorentz symmetries at the scales that we need to recover them and so on. So insofar as that the, there are these penalty dynamics in the community, I think that's a sign that in some respects there are, are plenty of constraint. And so it's, it's that the mantra masquerades as a comment about logic or epistemic structure when in fact it's a comment on what sort of practices are encouraged by peers in the community. And that's where the slippage, I think, ends up happening. Excellent. Thank you very much. Can I make just another yes, point before opening to the rest? Yes, go ahead, Francesca. Um, so, so we were talking about interpreting the theory, and uh, there is uh, one issue that is uh, somehow hidden uh, always in this conversation, that is the fact that uh, uh, in order to do quantum gravity, you have to talk about quantization. And uh, uh, quantization comes with different interpretation. So one of the, and specifically when we do cosmology, 
there is a question about uh, how different interpretation uh, leads to different uh, road, different positions in quantum cosmology. And uh, so you were, thank you so much for, for citing this idea of a distinction between uh, a totalology, <laughs> so the, the, the idea that you do quantum cosmology by uh, doing a theory of everything, or uh, doing quantum cosmology just by focusing you know, the degrees of freedom that corresponds to the largest scale of the universe, namely the scale factors, or maybe uh, some few more. And uh, I think uh, there is uh, something that is worth it to, to highlight at this point, because really taking uh, one definition or the other amounts to uh, which interpretation of quantum mechanics uh, you have in the back of your mind. Because uh, if you think that, and, and more than this, it amounts also of uh, how do you think about uh, um, gravity and space-time in terms of um, whether time is fundamental or not. Because so one, so the people who are uh, um, uh, supporting the idea that you can do a theory of everything in the sense of a theory of everything that exists, uh, that are some very good friends of mine, some people that I respect a lot, like Sean Carroll or Liz Mullin. So are people that uh, have a, an assumption in the, in the back of their mind that is the fact that uh, time is fundamental. So the so. I, I think you were hinting to a very good point, that is the fact that uh, there is a tension in the moment in which you think of this theory of everything uh, with respect to uh, a growing community thinking of uh, philosophy of physics in terms of a perspectivalism. But the thing is that uh, these people, people thinking about the theory of everything, think that in fact that there is everything and time. <laughs> So there is this one in the ingredient. So yeah, um, it's a point well taken that some moves that are going to be made in the phenomenology space even are going to be more or less sensitive to points of radical disagreement within the community. But I would say like, almost the same is true just when you go across approaches. Um, and so it's very easy to say that there might be a radical disagreement on like interpretations of quantum theory underneath it. Um, there might be these radical differences of interpretation with letting time be just a primitive resource that you can make use of, um, say on your observer side. Uh, but also I would say there seem to be these radical differences when um, you're on an approach that's like built out of the legacy of S matrices versus you're in an approach that's built out of a legacy of Hamiltonian geo. Yeah. And so the, the sense in which certain kinds of radical divergences are different than others, I, I get, I have less of a feel coming from outside as a philosopher that there's going to be an interesting difference. But a very good work for philosophers will be exactly to be careful about the fact that uh, these points of departure uh, create a mosaic of the yes. quantum gravity community that could be very, it's like putting different lenses. Because, for instance, uh, people emphasize always uh, the difference between uh, perturbative and non perturbative methods, like uh, having string theory on one side and heavy loop quantum gravity and all these other community on the other side. But in fact, uh, so you can also think that there is another distinction between who, people who think that there is a, a fundamental minimal scale, like a minimal area or minimal length and so on. Then you would put uh, loop quantum gravity, causal sets, uh, and string theory on the same camp. And on the other camp, you would have, uh, say, causal dynamical triangulations as separate. So I think it, it would be very interesting, I don't know if there is any students who want to volunteer, to, to see how uh, how many different di dimensions there are in this way of uh, mapping uh, the geography of uh, the quantum gravity community? Yeah, taking really seriously this idea that when you consider quantum gravity across approaches, say, you're trying to tackle what plural inquiry on a singular subject matter yeah. amounts to. And, sorry, and maybe then you can really find what are the intersections, what are uh, the ideas that are shared by all communities, uh, and you can use them to, to to look for some solid or more reliable phenomenology. That's the optimism. Yeah. yeah.
Uh, thank you very much. Lee Smolin, who's with us online, would like to ask a question. So please, Lee, go ahead. Oh, we can see that. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, good. Um, in this context, this is very interesting, but I wanted to know if the speaker had thought about relative locality in these contexts. And that's a look at it. If, if you want, I can characterize it, but it may be kind of curious whether it's well known in the community. Um, if you could say a tiny bit more, because there are at least two different senses of relative locality I can think of that in our community would be used. OK, relative locality refers to a class of extensions of special relativity where you try to realize the idea that there are two preferred constants, the speed of light and the maximum speed, say, the light, the travel. So, so, for example, you discover that you can make two, deserve two constants, and the new one is the ratio of the Planck energy to the energy of a particle. And these lead to different energy limitations and different predictions at <coughs> high energy. And as the last thing I'll say, the data, although this is not very well publicized, the data on the neutrino, high energy neutrino scattering at ice cube seems now to support the, the relative locality prediction over the standard special relativity prediction. Yeah, so the only intelligent thing I can say on this is, uh, I guess, maybe a cautioning, or a cautioning that I'm committed to making, whether or not it should be a caution, is um, whether we're thinking about relative locality as uh, you're using it as a hint that we've somehow globbed onto about how we're going to understand the world once we have an empirically satisfying theory of quantum gravity versus if it's um, the kind of result that's falling out of some common core kind of what Francesco is just getting at of considered across approaches with their fully loaded interpretations, at least some of these approaches can all simultaneously treat this as a feature of their ongoing uh, research. And so that's the difference I would plug in. The language that you're using to describe it sounds very naturally like this is a hint about how we're going to understand the future to be. And I'm in this closing the loop set of trying to push against thinking in terms of what hints do we have and pushing more how do we use the world in an ongoing research program. OK, that's, that's clear. Uh, certainly, I'm in the first group, but sure. other people are there. Yeah, the, the meeting in the middle is interesting. So you might say like approach neutral uh, attempts at uncovering quantum gravity, to what extent that's itself just another approach versus committed to a different kind of methodology is I think an interesting question that I don't at this point have much intelligence to say. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, great, thanks. Are there any other questions? Sakshi. Well, thank you so much for your talk. I think a part of my question might have started to been answered with your qualification to Francesca and you keep mentioning that this is supposed to be an iterative process, so maybe expanding on that will help. But it seems to me that based on your inversion um, methodology, where you start with semi-classical gravity and then you use that to motivate what kind of quantum gravitational phenomenology should come out, it seems to me there's what well, could be an intractable challenge because semi-classical gravity isn't a framework or a theory uh, with consensus behind it. 
especially because it gives rise to a host of paradoxes, one of which we'll be talking about tomorrow. And as a result, there's a lot of disagreement and controversy over what the boundaries of semi-classical gravity are, how much of GR you know, is included, how much of Q of T is included, or what novel semi-classical features uh, come out of you know, the attempt to meld the two. So I was wondering, because it seems to me that really what's going to happen, at least in the black hole context, which is what I'm familiar with, is you're going to have a quantum gravitational theory. And similar to what Francesca was saying, you have to go to the fundamentals of that and then reverse engineer semi-classical um, phenomena or you know, even a framework that would be a, an appropriate limit in, in a correspondence sense. So I was just wondering if you could say a bit more about how you get around that challenge. Yeah, so first, I'm being fast and loose in a, in a way that might invite fair criticism with, uh, I think I, I used the phrase, like the monster apparatus of semi-classical gravity at some point. I'm playing fast and loose with tools, techniques, suite of methods or strategies, and theory. Uh, one, ver one instance of being fast and loose with this is, like, maybe this is a, a very weird idea to me, but um, like uniquely my idea, and nobody else would espouse this, but um, I think paradoxes are a part of the toolkit that we get in some classical gravity. And so I think, to some extent, recovering paradox uh, is itself a fruitful activity to be going on. More fruitful than that is then recovering everything just slight of paradox. And then you get to say something nice, like, oh yeah, what we've learned about the world is that the suite of methods, the particular sub part of that suite of methods we were using that was giving rise to paradox uh, was misguided in a very particular way. Uh, this would be something like we want to solve paradoxes in the course of the ongoing research. And what it means to have solved them is to have learned why in retrospect there were some restrictions that we didn't realize on the use of these tools in these astrophysical contexts. Um, that would be one way in which to, to demonstrate how, I'm, how fast and loose I'm being with leveraging the interpretive resources of semi-classical gravity, uh, that even paradoxes are going to count as interesting building blocks. Dominic. Hi, thanks. Uh, what, what a lovely talk. Um, <laughs> Similar to Sakshi, I mean, you, you talk, I think, rightly about how quantum gravity does have a lot of empirical constraint, but a lot of the constraint which gets most discussed in the literature seems non-empirical, in the sense of recovering the bekenstein hawking entropy law, which is totally theoretical. We have no sort of empirical access to the fact that we think that's true, true, because we don't think Hawking radiation exists, and you might not assign Hawking radiation might not exist, we have no empirical access to it, and then you, you fall down that rabbit hole. So how, how seriously should we take the word empirical in that? How, how much are we a happy building theory, top theory, top theory, without ever making empirical contact? Because it seems a lot of the constraints aren't actually epistemic yet. Yeah, so the, the unsatisfying, like, cheap retort here is something like, we're not really engaged anymore, at least in philosophy, with trying to separate out theory statements from observer statements or empirical content from theoretical content. And I worry in a, in a charge like how you just articulated it, that actually all that's going on in the background is that you are making use of some shared implicit sense that we can split off and we can underwrite the truth of a claim that most of the work is not empirical in virtue of it using the claims that are on the theory side and not the empirical side. Uh, I say that's like cheap and unsatisfying because you might very well think, well, we don't know how to do it. But there is sort of a principal distinction here. Um, the slightly less cheap response is, uh, I don't have a good grip myself on how our feelings of the empiricalness of research should erode as we put theory on top of theory. Um, it seems like the empirical world is still in the background here, right? Like, people who embrace uh, entropy arguments in black holes, like, 
see themselves as engaged in an empirical project, generally speaking. Uh, and so that the, the force of the objection or the force of the worry as you're articulating it ends up, I think, resting on something that I just don't have a good grip on. Just like how, yeah, how confidence erodes as there seems to be more and more distance from the originating empirical concerns. Um, but it's, an, it's, I think, a good question to ask. I just don't have a good grip on Raymond. Thanks for the talk, Mike. It's very interesting. <clears throat> so I've read some of your other work in, the, in creativity and science. And I was wondering if you thought, uh, this is super open, open ended question, by the way. I'm not particularly trying to push back or anything. If I was wondering if you thought that this methodology you're talking about here has any relevance for um, creativity in science, or in particular, creativity in quantum gravity research. Yeah, so here's a metaphor, or like a metaphor in my mind that I have no idea whether I would defend it as a thesis, but it's definitely going. Uh, so when I was doing one of these creativity projects, uh, I got really into um, an aspect of uh, Carlo Rovelli's view um, developed in a, like the physics needs philosophy, philosophy needs physics thing. Um, and part of the, the thing that I, I latched onto in this was this idea that um, we should think of um, incremental steps in theoretical research or scientific research at large, if we're going to be ambitious in the scope of this, as like charting off in creative incremental ways from where we are. And that the charting out strategy can wind us up in some pretty inconceivable spaces. Uh, but that's just like part and parcel of the project. And that certainly fits nicely metaphorically with some kind of iterative strategy. And just as a general rule, iterative strategies you are plans, not strategies. You commit to them, and they unfold, and you wind up in surprising places. So there's a connecting metaphor. It might not make it to a full thesis, because both sides of that are model-dependent metaphors. Um, what does the space look like that you're incrementally charting out into? What is the kinematics of the iteration, of the like, time-dependent iterative function that you write down? These things just might not play nice with each other. Last question for us, please. Um, thank you very much for that, Mike. So I have a question uh, that relates to uh, trying to get clearer, I think, on your sense of the role of the observer in quantum gravity research. So you had sort of two senses that you were describing that I could pick out. One was this kind of distributed sense, and one was a more local sense. And I'm clear and it's the case that I'm thinking about the role of the observer in the context of cosmology. There's a kind of similar distinction that I draw, that the literature draws between a kind of third person point of view and a first person point of view. And I've, I was wondering whether the distinction that you were drawing maps onto that kind of distinction in cosmology. So uh, it does in a very limited way. The very limited way is that the third person view, the third person observer uh, is, I, in my accounting, a convenient uh, fiction that we use to inter-interpret domain-specific targets under observation, where observation can mean very different things in like a quantum information lab than they can mean in astrophysics. And that it's, there's a convenient fiction of a, a third person that is what you're using to inter-interpret results. That's the, the like thin connection. The slightly enlarged one is just to reiterate in a slightly different way uh, what I meant by these two different observers in the quantum cosmology case. Uh, there's something strange about studying a dynamics in one degree of freedom and calling it the evolution of cosmos. It's not strange any longer the moment you say, oh, it's the evolution of zeroth order structure, large, large scale structure. Uh, cosmic expansion. The reason why it's not mysterious is because in the background we have 
a way of relating a weird observer, the totally spatially smeared observer, and the more conventional observers that show up in all the rest of our physics, we have this Copernican principle. This idea that, oh, the observer witnessing the one degree of freedom expansion is the sort of statistically induced observer under a condition, under a certain generative inductive strategy. Um, and so that's, I would say, a worked example of this point where you need a, a third party, a third person observer to do the interinterpretation. But in each specific application, there's just a homegrown observer to talk about. So hopefully that. Excellent. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> so we will reconvene at 11 o'clock for Sean Gripp's talk. Please join me in thanking Mike and Francesca.